You know, lovely to have you here and to see you again. It's so good to see you because we go back a long way, don't we? We do indeed. <laughs> Rather too long. <laughs> it's been a long time indeed. But I'm so pleased because again, with everything you've done and all your research, you're moving into the world of, of the saints and the Anglo-Saxons, which we have in common. That's we my passion indeed. area too. Pilgrimage, cult of saints, medievalism and Anglo-Saxonism. Yes. Absolutely. So I'm very happy to, to be here talking about these things with you. Lovely to have you here today. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so first of all, can you provide a sort of brief overview of St Cuthbert and his life? Well, St Cuthbert, I wrote a book about saints and of all of the saints, Cuthbert for me is the one that reconciles the, the, the disparate aspects of what it meant to be an Anglo-Saxon saint most completely. Because he has an early life, um, possibly as a warrior, possibly, uh, it, certainly in the secular world, he, he's probably from a noble family. Mm -hmm. And um, from this life, he then enters a Celtic monast monastic environment, which is different um, to the sort of Benedictine rules that we see rolled out on the continent. But he, he develops within this, this context. And then he goes to Lindisfarne, um, at a point, really, that, that Lindisfarne is having to redefine itself, having to set itself up as a place where Roman and Celtic ideas can be merged together. Mm -hmm. And what we hear about Cuthbert, we don't get it from him, we get it from the people that write about him, that write about his, his life, and the artworks that survive associated with him, which is all very carefully coordinated in order to present him in a certain way. What we learn is that he is this wonderful kind of point of reconciliation. He is all things to all men. He's the perfect saint, the perfect monk, the perfect bishop. Of course, that isn't possible as a living, breathing individual, mm -hmm. but, uh, but that's the impression we get from him through down the ages. Uh, and actually, the stories you do read about him, there's a lot of stories associated with him in nature, lovely stories about him talking to the, the ravens and talking to the, <laughs> the otters, and, and those things kind of humanise him in a way, but we always have to be a bit careful that we are getting a second-hand account of who he is. Absolutely, yes. So you mentioned actually the curation of the art and the literature. So how do you think the sort of the power of the art and literature has shown to be an influential propagandist tool um, in the creation and promotion of his cult in the later years and the earlier years too, in fact? Well, it was very, there, was, there was quite clear guidelines within Anglo-Saxon England of how you developed a cult of saints. Um, saints were big business. They meant... Masses of income, tourism, um, investment, and relics were changing hands as, as you know, to the equivalent of fine artworks. They were big, big business. But um, when it came to Anglo-Saxon cults of saints, you've got these different groups, particularly in the north of England, who are all uh, slightly different. They're all offering alternative setups. Mm -hmm. So over at Jarrow and Monk Wormuth, you've got... Um, a hotbed of scholarship, of, of scriptorial activity, more Roman than Rome with its glass windows and its stone buildings and its massive Bibles. Over at Hexham and Ripon, you've got Wilfred, and he is modelling himself much more on the all-powerful bishop um, monks of Gaul. So he has impurpled manuscripts, he has uh, yeah, caskets that replicate uh, ivory caskets. That's his setup. Lindisfarne develops its own brand, its own unique uh, approach to the cult of Cuthbert, mm -hmm. which is deliberately blending Celtic art, Celtic ideas, with Roman influences, um, very self-consciously. So as, the, as an art historian, I mean, I, look, I can look at it and say, right, those swirls and spirals are Celtic. That Germanic pattern work there is Anglo-Saxon, that's Roman. But they are doing that deliberately. It's like graphic design, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're cultivating it to show that the saint himself, but also the community, is bringing all these ideas together. Yes. And do you think it's particularly significant that Edfrith, the Bishop of Lindisfarne, created the Lindisfarne Gospels himself, or well, we think he did himself? Do you think that's particularly significant? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I've worked with amazing scribes at Window Semi, and we took him to an Anglo-Saxon hall and tried to get him to recreate part of the Lindisfarne Gospels in the right environment with the right equipment. Um, so ink in shells and, and sitting on a bench. He said after about an hour and a half it was, he was in pain. 
because the conditions, he was freezing cold, the vellum was curling up, the inks were drying up. If you close the, wind, the shutters, you didn't get the light. If you open the shutters, the wind came through. He said the idea that Edward did this at all was remarkable, almost miraculous. But we do, I mean, you can see the consistency in the painting, in the artwork and in the text right the way through, the hand of one man, and not just any man, a bishop. Mm -hmm. So on top of making this, this manuscript, he's got his duties as, as bishop of this community. It's a huge investment and, and a real sense of personal sacrifice, I think. So what do you think then made a saint a saint within the Anglo-Saxon era? And how do you think, or do you think, that differed in the medieval era? Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> why I wrote the book. Because <laughs> That's the point. Um, it's a completely different set of criteria. What we currently associate with sanctity, um, it, you know, it goes through the congregations of the saints in the Vatican. They have to have performed certain miracles. They have to have um, lived a certain life. And it's incredibly critical and difficult to be declared a saint now. Going back through the medieval period, it becomes increasingly more, more um, centralised and organised. But going back to the Anglo-Saxon period, you know, the, the 7th, 8th century, anything goes really because the community declares somebody a saint. So you've got this incredible variety. On the one hand, you've got mad individuals like Guthlack, one of my favourites, who, who is famous for fighting invisible demons, which really just means there's a man in the fens waving his arms around at nothing, but he gets declared a saint by his community. Then you've got um, everything up to princes, princesses, nobility, royalty, who are having cults contrived for them. Um, but you've got men, you've got women, you've got both genders represented, and you've got all of society represented, because everybody from a pauper to a prince could be a saint in the Anglo-Saxon period. And it's that, that beautiful variety that I find so fascinating. And we lump them all together, we give them halos, stick them on you know, two-dimensional icons, and we dehumanise them. But the human beings behind these names are fascinating. Mm -hmm. Why do you think Oswald granted Aidan and his companions that small title, title island itself? Why there to found that monastery? Why? Oh, location, location, <laughs> location. It's all about the location. So th that island is opposite Bamborough Castle. And Bamborough Castle is the stronghold of the Northumbrian royal family. Uh, an incredible natural plateau with potential fortifications on it that date back to Iron Age. But that has become the, the, the powerhouse of these um, Northumbrian kings who are toying with different types of Christianity. They're poised on a moment of great change. So we talk about Edwin of Northumbria as sort of the first Christian Northumbrian king. But this is a point when they don't know which direction to go in. Christianity comes in a sort of two-pronged attack to the Anglo-Saxons. So Columba and the Irish monasticism is establishing in Iona. And then, of course, with Aidan, it starts to creep over towards Lindisfarne. But simultaneously, almost, St. Augustine arrives with the missionaries from Rome in Kent. And Northumbria is that, that wonderful melting pot where the two parties meet and have to negotiate which is orthodox, which is the right way to go. Mm -hmm. And so granting Lindisfarne to Aden and to the, the, sort of the Celtic movement is quite a radical decision by the, um, the Northumbrian royal family. But the location is important too because one of the things you see in Celtic monasticism is this idea of leaving the world behind, trying to find a desert um, the closest thing to a desert, which is often an island or a mountain or you know, something in, inaccessible. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Lindisfarne is tidal and an island makes it the perfect location for a Celtic monastery. Absolutely. Now you mentioned location, location, location. And obviously St Cuthbert lived on the tidal islands out on St Cuthbert's Isle and then he also lived at Innerfarn too. Now do you think therefore that the aromatical lives that they lived on them affected the saints and therefore their behaviour? I mean, you talk about Guthlack and his yeah. behaviour, odd behaviour, as we would put it today. Do you think that affected them? I get asked a lot about how, retrospectively, from a you know, modern point of view, looking backwards, if these people have mental health issues, or if, mm -hmm. yeah, what medical terms, from a modern perspective, could we apply to these people? Now, they have no conception of this as a me you know, mental health or, or medical issue. To a lot of these people, there must be a spiritual reason if they're seeing things or if they're experiencing things. It has to be either from God or the devil. And that is difficult for us to deal with from a modern point of view. But I do think that just the conditions under which these um, hermit saints are living, they must have been 
deeply affected on a, an emotional and a physical level. One of the things I found recently uh, interviewing the archaeologist that worked on Skellig Michael, the cemetery at Skellig Michael, was the extreme physical trauma that the skeletons displayed. So the monastic community there dates to about 800 AD, and they're on the top of this subaquatic mountain in a set of cells hundreds of feet up a mountain that's sheer like this. Mm -hmm. And all of the skeletons in the cemetery showed extreme trauma to the bones, the shoulders and the back from carrying things, but most upsettingly, the feet bones. The bones on these people's feet were actually sort of cut through, shredded to ribbons from walking up and down this mountain. Yeah. And what, what is that? What is it that is making them leave behind the comfort of the, the shore go to this place of isolation and then punish their bodies. Mm. That is, the intention is to suffer like Christ, but it also becomes a, a, a cult of pain in many ways, that, that you know, they, are, they are being more extreme than the next person. And Cuthbert can't do that, he can't go to, to Skellig, he can't cut himself off completely. But taking himself to Farn, and we know in the Farn, and we know that he had a cell that sort of shut out the world and just looked at the sky. Yeah. Um, that is all in emulation of these, these, uh, these sites, yeah. saints that are on these mountain islands. So the Durham monks returned to Lindisfarne with St Cuthbert's relics, as we know, by the early 12th century, and they then established a permanent cell of the Durham community there. Its purpose, as we know, was to reaffirm the link between Anglo-Norman Durham and Anglo-Saxon Lindisfarne and to establish the right of the Norman monks of Durham to be the guardians of St Cuthbert's legacy. So how do you think this was then enacted? I know it's a tricky question. <laughs> it's a tricky well, Actually, it's all down to politics, isn't it? Because yeah. I think that uh, you know, when we get the Viking incursions, 793, Lindisfarne is sacked, the community is decimated, but they manage to retain this, their, their primary relics. Um, the Lindisfarne Gospels, the coffin and remains of Cuthbert, but also the head of Oswald as well. And that mo mobility, that movement of those relics is, in a way, documented much later as being about the survival of the community. As long as those objects are with a handful of the surviving monks, there is still a Lindisfarne, a concept of Lindisfarne. But what we have then is the reappropriation of that concept. When the Normans arrive and um, radically transform everything from states and, and religious politics down to a micro level. Once they're re redoing all of the redesigning society, they have to embrace cults of saints. And there's two ways that they do this. One is to reject saints, to declare them null and void. So there were many, many Anglo-Saxon cults that have been lost. Uh, the other way is to re to appropriate them. So we see them appropriating Alban. We see them appropriating. Um, Edmund the Martyr, different saints in different locations, in Bury St Edmunds, but we see them doing that with Cuthbert and at Durham. And Durham is, I mean, anyone that's been to Durham Cathedral, the way that West Front is designed, it is castle architecture. It's a castle cathedral. And that is a, a powerhouse, again, of how the Normans want to be perceived. And validating it with the remains of Cuthbert and Bede and Oswald, that is all about supporting and bolstering that place. Yeah. So finally then, a lot of what we see on Lindisfarne today, and in a farm too, was actually built in the later medieval period, 14th century. Mm. So it isn't contemporary with Cuthbert's life. Can we therefore look at it as a bit of a sort of tourist attraction theme park for the, for the medieval pilgrims? What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I first got taken to Lindisfarne by my now husband, then boyfriend, for Valentine's Day, when we'd only known each other for a few months, and I remember thinking, if he thinks that a, a Valentine's trip to Lindisfarne in February is a good idea, then clearly he knows me well. He's a keeper, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so we went over to, to Lindisfarne for the first time. And, and the thing is, it's like any of these, but it's a bit like Iona as well. Although Iona has a purity to it because it's so sparsely populated around there. Um, there is a sense in which the whole place is focused on these particular characters, this particular perceived Celtic Christianity that, that actually is quite intangible. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a sort of Disneyland aspect to it, but I think that what, is, what you do get is the sense of the tides. And actually, every time I've been, you, you know, you know this, because I mean, you've been to it, but 
you are fighting the tides. If you miss the tides, you are stranded either on or off the island. And that hasn't changed for a millennium. So that takes me back. And there is an authenticity to the space. And actually, archaeological digs are going on at the moment. The archaeology that's coming out of the ground at the moment about the Anglo-Saxon uh, community at Lindisfarne is, is really exciting. And it shows that where, that, where we do have that later medieval uh, building, the community itself was very nearby. And actually, that site was the site of Cuthbert um, and Aidan's community. So, so there is there is continuity, and, and with anything Anglo-Saxon, it's very hard to reconstruct the space realistically in, in a genuine way because they built in timber predominantly, mm -hmm. and a lot of it is lost. Yeah. So, yeah, it is a bit of a Disneyland for medievalists, but um, but again, it's it's about the site. Yeah. You could say the same about Whitby, couldn't you? You've got Whitby Abbey, that iconic kind of Gothic structure on the landscape. And yet the space goes back to Hild, it goes back to the 7th century, and I still feel that you get that essence of, of you know, continuity of use from a place. It's more about the inherent sacrality than... I think so. And the importance of location, again, you know, why are they on headlands? Why are they on tidal islands? Uh, there's a choice, uh, and they've, they're chosen because they're, they're beautiful, spiritual, special places. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> it's been lovely talking to you, Mella.